Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you are enjoying this program, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. And I want to go ahead and thank Carl and Carolyn and also Francis for supporting the program by mailing a donation to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, that's P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. You can also become one of our Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just go to patreon.greatdetectives.net. And I want to thank Daniel for becoming our latest Patreon supporter at the Master Detective level of $15 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Daniel. Now it is time for this week's episode of Dangerous Assignment. The original air date, November the 5th, 1952. And the title is The Smuggling Racket. Dangerous Assignment, transcribed starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though, trouble, but... When I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize that this assignment's going to show that sometimes the only way you can win is to let the whole deal go up in smoke. Morning, Commissioner. You sent for me? Steve, do you know anything about high ally? Handball game Latin style, isn't it? Fast and furious and pretty rugged. Especially if you get conked with a ball, it'll kill you. Well, here's hoping you don't get conked, because you're going to attend the high ally games at... One of the arenas in Havana tonight. And you're going to bet on the team of Danielle and Scobo. Are they good? Haven't the faintest idea. We're only interested in the man who is going to take her bet. Look, what's this all about, Commissioner? Well, some time now, we've been trying to crack down on a smuggling ring operating out of Havana, running a regular shuttle between Florida and Cuba. What are they running? You name it. Everything in the book, including illegal entry now and then. We finally got a lead on the organization, Steve, from someone working on the inside. That the boy I'm to contact? The one who's going to take my bet? Right. He'll be at the Fronton Palace, window three. You place your bet, and when you open your wallet, let him have a glance at your credentials. He'll take it from there. Get whatever information you can from him. Track down that organization and smash it. Well, that's it, Steve. You've got your assignment. Good luck. The National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you will find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. A sufficient supply of blood and blood plasma to save the lives of our wounded soldiers in Korea continues to be of the utmost importance. Now, the reserve is still at a critically low ebb. And to give our wounded G.I.s the blood they must have to save their lives and speed recovery, a minimum of 300,000 pints a month is absolutely essential. Whole blood and blood plasma are the one treatment for which medical skill cannot provide a substitute. There is no sensation at all to the donor except the good feeling of knowing some wounded soldier will be thankful all his life for what the blood donor is giving. So remember, make an appointment at once with your nearest Red Cross blood center. Sure, 
I've got my assignment. Get down to Havana. Bet a couple of bucks on a team of highlight players and hope it pays off with the information we need to nail a ring of smugglers operating between Cuba and the United States. It's late afternoon when my plane sets down in Havana. I check in at my hotel, and that night, I wander over to the front and palace, a large indoor arena used for highlight games. Their teams on the floor are going at it hot and heavy, and the crowd is building steam. I watch them for a while, and then I ease over to the window number three to place my bet. Si, senor. I'll put a five spot on Danielli and Scobo. Si. Got quite a crowd here tonight. Tonight and every night, senor. Ayala is a very popular spot in Havana. Here you are. Thanks. Here's your five. Gracias, senor. There is an alley in back of the building. I will be waiting in my car. Half an hour, senor Micho. I'll be there. back to my seat and watch the players until the half hour is up. Then I ease around to the alley in the back. Spot the ticket seller sitting in a parked car close by. He doesn't answer when I come up. I reach in and he topples over on the steering wheel. at the Fronton for the past two years. In Francisco Rodas, no police record. That's all we have on the dead man, huh, Lieutenant? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, you say he was involved with the smuggling ring, Senor Mitchell? So we were led to believe he was going to fill us in on it. Only somebody with a knife got to him first. Someone obviously from the organization. They must have known he was going to talk. Yeah. Where was Rodas staying? According to his identification card, uh, 36 Paseo de Baracoa. Let's go over and shake it down. The police lieutenant and I hustle over to the dead man's apartment, spend a good part of the night giving it a going over. Nothing. See, next morning he isn't alone when I walk into his office. This is Jose Diego, a dock worker. Hey, senor. All right. There was a story in the morning's paper of the murder back at the fronton last night, senor Mitchell. Jose read about it and came straight to police headquarters. Oh? Jose, uh, tell Senor Mitchell what you have just told me. Eh, si, si. Eh, last night, Senor, I was at the fronton to the games, you know. A little after 10 o'clock, I left the arena. Uh, I had promised my wife I would be home early. Go on. As I walked past the alley entrance in back of the building, uh, a man come running out. Uh, we collided. He continued to run, but as he passed under the street light, I see his face. You recognized him? Si, si. It was Senor Carmody. Carmody? An American. He has lived in Havana a good many years. You see, myself, I have never met him, but I have seen him many times, senor. Uh, he's well known here. A, uh, shall we say, a, a sportsman, senor Mitchell. He has a fondness for high-speed automobiles and motorboats. Oh? Also, he owns an airplane and a yacht. Does he? Well, that sounds very interesting, Lieutenant. Yeah, very interesting. I suggest we pay a call on senor Carmody. I second the motion. Oh, by the way, you mentioned you had placed a bet at the fronton on Daniel and Scobo. That's right. Don't tell me that... They lost. Hmm. Harmony's place is a low, rambling ranch house at the edge of town. He greets us at the door wearing a black silk dressing gown and a white muffler. He's carrying a tall glass of tomato juice and an obvious hangover. We follow him inside. Well, I'd like to have you meet an old friend, Ralph Pawson. Morning, gentlemen. Mr. Mitchell, Lieutenant Moreno. Lieutenant? Police department. Oh. Don't ask me what this is all about, Ralph. I wouldn't know. Uh, sit down, Jens. Thank you. And let's get on with it. My mood is not getting any better. I'd just like to ask you a few questions, Carmody. Sure. Where were you last night? Last night? <laughs> Brother, a lot of places, Mitchell. So they tell me. Go anywhere near the front and palace, say around 10 o'clock? The front room? No. No, I don't think so. Look, what's this all about? Murder. Murder? A man named Francisco Rodas was murdered in the alley behind the building a few minutes after 10 o'clock. Hey, there was something about that in the morning paper. Say, what's this got to do with me? Someone saw you running out of that alley shortly after the crime was committed. What? Now, see here, Mitchell, are you accusing I him? I just want to know what Carmody was doing there. He was with me. We had dinner at the yacht club. Yeah, that's right. Fill in the time. Now, well, we met at the club around 7. You can check with the waiters. They'll tell you. What time did you leave? Oh, around 10.30. Can I check that with the waiters, too? Well, Porson? Look, uh... Wait a minute, Ralph. 
No need to stick your neck out on my account. What he says is true, Mitchell. We had dinner together at the club, but I left early. How early? A little before 9.30. Ralph had a phone call to make. I remember that much. Not too much more, I'm afraid. Have a rough night? Yeah. While I was waiting for Ralph, I spotted some friends at the bar. I went over, had another couple of drinks, and the next thing I knew, I was outside. Go on. Well, there's not much more to tell. I remember walking down the street, the Avenida Ruiz. It's all sort of vague after that. I finally got home around here about midnight. Hey, this dead man, what was his name? Uh, Rodas. Francisco Rodas. Never heard of him. What'd he do? He was employed at the front door, senor. Still doesn't register, Lieutenant. Perhaps it will, senor. After you have taken a ride with us to police headquarters. Come along. We take Carmody down to the brig. The witness, Jose Diego, positively identifies Carmody as the man he saw running away from the scene of the crime and the local law books Carmody on suspicion of murder. A few minutes later, friend Pawson shows up with a lawyer in tow. The lawyer goes in to see Carmody and Pawson tags after me as I walk out of police headquarters. I spend the next couple of hours with him as he fills me in on Carmody and the rest of the afternoon checking on names and addresses he's given me. It all adds up to a big nothing. Late in the day, I wind up on the Avenida Ruiz near the Yacht Club. I've got a copy of the morning newspaper with me, Comedy's picture on the front page. I show it around, peddlers, shopkeepers, bartenders. No one remembers seeing Comedy last night until I run into a cab driver several blocks down the street. This one, senor. Oh, si, si, I remember him. Oh, boy. Ten dollars American he give me. You sure this is the man? Si, si. Could I forget ten dollars? Where did you pick him up? Right here in this corner. What time? Oh, it was early, I think. How early? Just early. Nine thirty or so? Si, si, it's possible nine thirty. Where did you take him? To the Fronton Palace? Fronton? No, senor, no. I drive him to Sebastian's Casino. It's on the other side of town. Oh. Lieutenant Moreno speaking. Steve Mitchell, Lieutenant. I'm calling from Sebastian's Casino. See? Si. Looks like maybe Carmody isn't our boy after all. What? Half a dozen employees of the casino remember seeing him here last night, including a couple of house cops who bounced him out of the joint for creating a disturbance. What time was he there, senor? He arrived a few minutes before 10, was given the bums rush a half hour later. Which means he could not have been in the alley back of the fronton at the time of the murder. Right. Looks like we'll have to start all over, Lieutenant. You can start chewing your fingernails. I'll be over to join you. I hurry out of the casino, start down the narrow street, but I don't get very far. A car suddenly pulls away from the curb across the way. I duck, but not fast enough. If you want your child to have the best elementary schooling you can give him, won't you get a pencil and paper to take down the address I'm going to give you at the end of this message? Unless we start preparing now, in a few years, our public schools will be as behind the times as the little red schoolhouse. Because of the huge increase in our birth rate during and after the last war, it's estimated that by 1956, there will be some 7 million more children in elementary schools than there are now. We must start preparing at once. More equipment will be needed, textbooks, playgrounds, and above all, more elementary school teachers. Now, to help assure your child a proper education, join and work with local groups and school boards. And for free information about how people in other communities are improving their schools, write to this address, National Citizens Commission for Public Schools, 2 West 45th Street. That's National Citizens Commission for the Public Schools, 2 West 45th Street, New York, 19, New York. Now, back to Dangerous Assignment and Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. So, you are all right? Huh? Oh, Lieutenant Moreno. Sure, I'm just dandy. <laughs> Brother, my head. This scalp one. The doctor, as you see, has bandaged it. How'd they get here? A cab driver brought you in. What happened? 
I got shot at as I was leaving the casino. After you telephoned to me that Camari was in the clear? Yeah, he must be. All of those witnesses there couldn't have lied. They all swore Carmody was there at the time of the murder. I think we ought to have another talk with our obliging little witness, Jose Diego. Don't make him look anymore, Reno. I swear to you, I'm telling the truth. Look, how could you have seen Carmody in the alley behind the front on Palace when half a dozen people swear he was in the casino at the time? Well, how do I know how such a thing could be? All I know is it was... Lieutenant Moreno speaking. What? But... Very well, send her in. Uh, that will be all for the present, Diego. You will wait in the next room. See? Si. What now? An American woman, a senora Henderson, insists on seeing me. She says it has to do with the matter we are investigating. Oh? Come in. Lieutenant Moreno? Yes. Uh, may I present Senor Mitchell? How do you do? Mrs. Henderson? What can I do for you, Senora? I'll be brief. My name is Barbara Henderson. I- I'm from Miami. I arrived here in Havana two weeks ago looking for my husband. Oh? You see, he left me during the war. His name was Jim Henderson. We were married in Baltimore in January of 1944. I see. And you have reason to believe your husband is not here in Havana? Yesterday, I found out without a doubt that he's here. Look, Mrs. Henderson, this is all very interesting, but I don't quite see what it has to do with the case we're investigating right now. Just this. See this picture in the newspaper? The man you're holding here is a suspect? Sure. His name is Carmody. No, you're wrong, Mr. Mitchell. That's my husband, Jim Henderson. Lieutenant and I look at each other. All of a sudden, the whole case is busted wide open again. We have Carmody brought in from his cell. Mrs. Henderson promptly drapes herself on him. Jim, Jim. Hey, what is this? Oh, Jim, please. Why did you leave me? Look, what gives here? Who is she, Mitchell? Mrs. Henderson. And she says you're Mr. Henderson. What? Jim, don't do this to me. Look, I've never seen this dame before in my life. Why, you... Hey. He's lying, Lieutenant. He is Jim Henderson. We were married in Baltimore in January 1944, and he deserted me. Yes, I can. I was in the Army in New York in January 1944. I could have married this babe in Baltimore. You were in the Army, huh? I sure was. You can check that, Mitchell. Don't worry, Carmody. I will. Mrs. Henderson gives us the name of her hotel and leaves. We send Carmody back to his cell, and I get off a cable to Washington about him. Then... We send for Pawson, who promptly swears he was with Carmody in Europe during 1944. The three of us wait in Lieutenant Marino's office for a reply from Washington. Every time Pawson finishes a cigarette, he methodically rips open the paper, scatters the tobacco flakes in the ashtray, and crumples the paper into a tiny ball. Finally, Marino can't stand it anymore. Why do you do that? Nerves? That's uh, Army, isn't it, Pawson? Yeah, yeah. If you ever had a police at camp yard, you'd know why, Marino. The tobacco flakes mingle with the dust, and the crumpled up paper is a lot less noticeable than a cigarette butt on the ground. Very sensible. Yeah, comedy taught me that when we were in together. Hey, look, when are you guys going to lay off him? I told you we were in Europe together. How could he have married that woman? How could he have anything to do with any of this? Come in. Ah, the answer to your cable, Mitchell. Yeah. Well? Carmody was in Europe in January of 1944. Yeah, now are you satisfied? Yeah. Look, it's pretty obvious to me that this guy Henderson is the one you really want. Looks that way. Come on, Lieutenant. Let's check with Mrs. Henderson again, see if she can give us any further information on her husband. We check at Mrs. Henderson's hotel, but she's not in. The clerk expects her back momentarily, so we decide to wait in her room. A very mystifying case, Mitchell. Yeah. Either there is a guy named Henderson and he's our man, or... Or what? I don't know. Something bothering me about this whole setup. What is it? Can't put my finger on it. I know what you mean. I wish Mrs. Henderson would show up. It has only been a few minutes. A cigarette? Thanks. You know, this whole deal has been one big merry-go-round. Cost us a lot of time, Moreno. You're right. But what else can we do? That's a good question. I... Hey, wait a minute. What is it? This ashtray. See, what about it? Take a look. Just a couple of cigarette butts with lipstick and... Mitchell. Yeah? 
flakes of tobacco and tiny balls of cigarette paper. Boss. Rather, I said this deal had cost us a lot of time. That's just the way it was planned. Come on. We head for Pawson's apartment. He's not there. We do a fast checkup on him and uncover a couple of very interesting facts, one of which sends us hightailing down to the waterfront. This is the place, Mitchell. Yeah. Pawson's lawyer said he owned that little cluster of fishing boats out there at the pier. Five will get you ten that he's on one of them right now, getting ready to shove off. You take one side, I will take the other. We split up. I work my way along the row of boats. They're all dark except for small deck lights. Then suddenly I spot somebody climbing aboard one of them. It's Mrs. Henderson. I slip aboard and grab her. Mitchell! But just then something hard connects with the back of my head. I go to my knees. Sorry, Mitchell. Been standing out here on deck in the dark for several minutes waiting for Barbara. You know, Pawson, you're giving this head of mine a pretty rough go. First you crease it with a slug, then you massage it with a gun, but... Like I say, I'm sorry. All right, lean against the rail. You'll be okay. Yeah, thanks. I guess I will. You've been leading Moreno and me a merry chase in the deal. First you hire Jose Diego to swear that he saw Carmody near the scene of Rhoda's murder. We find out that he couldn't have been. Then you hire your pal Barbara here to pose as Mrs. Henderson with a phony story about her husband. Sounds to me like you've been working for time. Right. 48 hours of it, to be exact. It's taken me that long to convert my Havana holdings to cash. Sure, I could have taken a potter right after I killed Rodas, but I had to leave broke. This way, I'm carrying about 100 grand with me. Heading the smuggling ring must have been profitable. Oh, yes. You see, Mitchell, if I hadn't given you a bum steer right off the bat, you'd have probably concentrated more on the victim's background. You'd have discovered he used to work for me in the fishing fleet here. That probably would have gotten you interested in me right off the bat. I had to stall that off until I got my money. Ah, You did a pretty neat job of it, too. If it hadn't been for those crumpled cigarette papers in Barbara's room, I might never have tumbled. Oh, so that was it, huh? Oh, very careless of me. What are you waiting for, Parson? Kill him. Not here. It's too noisy. You're coming out with us on the boat, Mitchell. Oh, bully for me. Okay, let's get started. Hardly. I doubt if you came down here alone, Mitchell, your friend Marino must be around. If we start the boat now, he'll flash a warning to the harbor patrol. So we'll just stand here in the dark, nice and quiet, until he comes along. And we'll take care of him first. Really, senor? What? Watch out, Marino! I've got him! Oh! Sorry, Barbara, old girl, but you're not leaving. Let go! Oh, relax. You okay, Lieutenant? Yes, his shot was quite wild. And before I could return it, you had taken care of him quite effectively. Well, I sort of felt I owed him then. How'd Marina know you were on this boat, Mitchell? He signaled, told me. Signal? Sure. Boston gave the idea when he told me to lean on the rail. See that little black deck light beside it? I was passing my hand back and forth in front of it while I was talking to Boston. My body screamed it from you. I figured the flashing light would bring Marino. Which it did, in the nick of time. Yeah, I guess you might say you finally saw the light, huh? Our star, Brian Donlevy, will return in just a moment. What did you do for your country today? Stand guard at some lonely outpost? Stand watch on the cold, windswept bridge of a patrolling U.S. Navy destroyer? No, but you can still do your part to guard peace. The peace that is for the strong. Make today your D-Day. Buy an extra bond for defense. And then keep buying them regularly. There's no safer, surer investment than with United States defense bonds. And you build security not only for yourself, but your country, too, when you buy defense bonds. They serve to combine America's economic strength with its military strength. And it's this combined strength that protects your town, your home, your right to work and prosper in peace. And remember, if you don't save regularly, you generally don't save at all. So join the payroll savings plan where you work, or sign up for the bond-a-month plan where you bank. Make today your D-Day. Buy defense bonds. Always remember, defense is your job, too. Next week, Turkey. I nominate myself for a slab in the morgue. And that will be Steve Mitchell's dangerous assignment next week.
Included in tonight's cast were Harry Bartell, Tony Barrett, Nestor Piva, Herb Ellis, and Kay Stewart. This is John Storm speaking. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, with Herb Butterfield as the commissioner, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian John Doe and is produced and directed by Bill Karn. Be with us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another transcribed Dangerous Assignment. <laughs> Tomorrow, hear both the Judy Canova Show and Truth or Consequences on NBC. Welcome back. This was a really neat story. Uh, it made good use of the 25-minute time, and it was really quick and fast-paced, and I like the twist of all of the red herrings being because the murderer was playing for time before he could convert his assets into something he could take out of the country. Overall, just a really well-written and fun story. Well, we turn now to listener comments and feedback. And Frances, along with her check, sent along a question Bold venture in the future, perhaps. Well, thanks so much, Francis. I appreciate the donation and the uh, question slash reminder about Bold Venture. Currently, the plan with Bold Venture is that we will present it when we launch the adventure series in 2025. And that will remain the plan as long as there aren't any complications, which I don't anticipate there will be. Uh, thank you so much for the question, uh, Francis. Then we go to YouTube. Your comment about a henchman speaking up and telling his boss he's t sick of him calling him stupid or unintelligent. In the recent Philip Marlowe movie starring Liam Neeson, the henchman actually does that. Oh, good to know. And I guess that's another point for seeing it. Angel writes in uh, regarding dangerous assignment. When he walks into the boss's office, Brian Donlevy never knows up. He'll end up uh, redacted right up to the time he walked into the sponsor's office and found he'd end up, period. Though I'm a constant listener and try at least... Everything old-time radio, Dangerous Assignment is just too wooden for me. It's on a path with The Man Called X. But the latter is, if not lifted, at least leavened by Leon Belasco as Pagon Zellschmidt. Dangerous Assignment rolls tediously and painfully on shot bearings. Did I mention I'm an auto mechanic? Dangerous Assignment is a you-go... Puffing behind the man called X, a dour Trabant. The police procedurals, both of these fitting a broadcast of the style, run the gamut, as do all the styles with many entrants. What's wrong with a uh, dangerous assignment and the man called L X? Listen to Nightbeat and Dragnet, whatever Steve Mitchell and Ken Thurston lack, uh, Randy Stone and Joe Friday have got. I'm also an imp. I'd like to have heard Richard Diamond or Sam Spade's rendition of any Man Called X or Dangerous Assignment storyline. Thanks, as always, for presenting all. Well, thank you so much, uh, Angel. I appreciate the comment. It's kind of interesting. In the last few weeks, we've gotten uh, this comment, and then we also had... A uh, one or two saying, I don't get Mr. Chameleon. And of course, yeah, back when we started the podcast, I knew that uh, in order to get the most people listening, I'd have to have a pretty broad range of shows. Because a lot of people who would love Pat Novak for hire would have no interest in the Sherlock Holmes. And I guess this is the same sort of thing. Now, 
I think you can enjoy a series and still see its shortcomings. And I think with Dangerous Assignment, there can be a situation where it kind of just becomes Steve goes out in search of the MacGuffin of the week. And I can also get how the opening might seem a bit repetitive. And it's interesting in a way. They made the Dangerous Assignment TV program. And after a few episodes, the series started to vary its opening. Not all of the episodes began with Steve in the commissioner's office. Now, some of this might have been an actor availability issue with Herb Butterfield. They had other episodes where he did meet with someone, and in that case, it tended to be like a deputy played by Lyle Talbot. But they had episodes where Steve had already gotten his assignment, and they were starting uh, in mid-action. And there seemed to be a recognition with a TV show that it made sense to have some variety in how the show opened. But in the radio program, it didn't change. Even though by this point in the radio program history, all the episodes of Dangerous Assignment on TV had been released. So it's interesting how that creative direction didn't seem to transmit back from uh, television to radio. But that said, I think there are some things that really do make Dangerous Assignment appealing to me. I love the sort of globe-trotting nature of the series, even though I don't like that we have so many episodes that happen in non-specific cities and non-specific countries. I think the mysteries, just like in uh, this week's episode, are generally pretty solid, and I also love the sort of adventure and action elements that work into the whole story and then also into the big finales. I also think that Steve has an approach to solving problems that's kind of interesting and different from other detectives. So I enjoy the series and you know I appreciate though that other people's opinions can vary. Now, there is no case I'm aware of of script reuse from Dangerous Assignment or The Man Called X to another detective series. The closest I have is that there is a a script for The Silent Men that became a Nightbeat story. And there's also a Sam Spade script that became a Mr. Moto story, which was actually the first sort of uh, espionage spy detective series we played. So hopefully I'll eventually do those as some of the twice-told stories that we do at uh, listener support campaign time. But again, thank you so much. Appreciate the comment, Angel. And then I have a comment on Spotify from DeGlossia regarding the uh, stars on the air episode of House on 92nd Street. We played as a 4,200th episode special. Uh, the person writes, uh, this was a good episode. More from this series, please, Adam. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we've got a few episodes of stars uh, on the air that are circulating, but most don't fit in the detective uh, genre. I think the only one that did was the house on 92nd Street. However, Stars in the Air and Hollywood Soundstage really were just Screen Guild Theater by another name. And I think you'll definitely hear some more Screen Guild Theater episodes as we go along. Thank you so much for the comment. Well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Marla. Marla has been one of our Patreon supporters since January 2018, currently supporting the podcast at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Marla. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And if you're enjoying the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. All that great stuff that helps YouTube channels grow. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of Dangerous Assignment. But join us back here tomorrow for Mr. Chameleon, where... Mrs. Flaubert, who survives him besides yourself, his niece, and a nephew, Thaddeus Harper? Well, there are two other nieces... 
one in New Zealand and one in California. And, of course, cousin Lucy Billingsley. She's an orphan. She lives here in New York. And who are Silas Harper's heirs? We are, Mr. Chameleon. That is to say, my wife Harriet is. You are his sole heir, Mrs. Flaubert? Yes. Uncle Silas himself gave me his will last night. It's right here. He gave it to you last night, just before he was murdered. Very convenient. What do you mean by that? I mean, I want to know exactly where you and your husband were last night at the time your uncle was murdered. I was in bed, that's where. I was here, too. Is that correct, Miss Flaubert? Your husband was here with you? I don't know where he was. I was asleep. Well, what are you trying to do to me, Harriet? Tell this man Chameleon the truth. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.